As we mentioned, the model for the Milwaukee Children's Zone comes from New York City, and President Barack Obama wants to see urban school districts across the country copy what's happening in Harlem, happening in a program that catapults formerly failing students into college graduates. It's called the Harlem Children's Zone. It encompasses a roughly 100-block area in one of New York City's toughest and poorest areas and includes a charter school, preschool, after school, and even a baby college for parents to learn how to parent successful kids. Children included in the Harlem Children's Zone have free access to health care, mental health care, and sports and arts programs. The new way of reaching and teaching low-income students is closing the so-called achievement gap for the nearly 10,000 students in the program. This by way of longer school days and longer school years and high standards and accountability for teachers and parents and the students themselves. Its leader is Jeffrey Canada, who was in Madison speaking to Wisconsin educators this week. We got a chance to sit down with Canada during his visit. We started by asking why the Harlem Children's Zone is known as education from cradle to college. Well, we really believe that in some communities, particularly communities like Harlem, where so many children are underperforming, that you've got to start working with children from birth. We get their parents even before the kids are born, when, when the mothers are pregnant. And we began to talk to them about brain development and what they need to do about reading to their child and singing to their child and playing and talking with their child. So the child really enters school uh, ready to learn with all of the vocabulary words and the skills necessary to be successful. And then we think we have to stay with those children uh, throughout their whole academic career. We don't work with a kid for seven, eight years and think it's going to be fine. Uh, she's going to do well. He's gonna... We stay with those kids till they graduate high school, get them into college, and then we stay with them until they finish college. And we consider success a child who has graduated with a degree. Everything up to that is just sort of leading to success. But this is really about trying to make sure that these kids are able to get jobs uh, you know, support themselves and their families, and we break the cycle of generational poverty in Harlem. Well, it, it sounds fabulous, but the price tag has got to be astronomical. Well, we tell folk that we spend on average $5,000 per year per child. Uh, and while people sometimes think, oh my goodness, and that doesn't include school costs, which we have a separate allocation to pay schools, uh, but on these same children in communities like Harlem, uh, we're spending $37,000 a year to lock these kids up. We're spending $200,000 to put kids in juvenile detention facilities for a year. Our theory is, let's just make sure we do smart investments for children. Uh, give them the kinds of head starts that allow them to go out and become productive citizens. Costly? I don't think so in the end. We're spending that money on incarceration, on special education, on emergency room admits, on mental health issues. I mean, we're spending huge amounts of money on these same children. Uh, we say let's spend the money in a positive way instead of waiting until the kids mess up and then spend the money then. How do you spend that 5000 that you're talking about outside of the actual educational costs yeah. in the school? Well, we, we run after school. Our schools are open uh, for 11 months a year. Uh, they stay open until 6, because after school goes till 6. We run programs on Saturdays and on Sundays. We have great sports programs and arts programs. And so we really try to make sure that we cover all the needs of the children. If a child's family is in crisis, we have a social worker to work with the child and the family. We want to make sure that we try and take care of all of the basic needs for children. So that's medical, it's dental, it's mental health. Uh, we just want our kids, and by the way, it doesn't produce super children. Uh, those are the kind of things middle class children take for granted. Uh, even providing those supports, kids still have to get a great education from great teachers uh, and great leaders. But we think we shouldn't have to have kids growing hungry or, or being sick or coming from troubled homes where there's violence and expect them to compete with middle class children. So uh, all of this, what kinds of successes have you seen? Well, one of the things that's really exciting for us is that Dr. Roland Fryer of Harvard, a uh, well-established economist, found out that we closed the achievement gap between black and white students uh, in our elementary schools. Uh, and even in our middle schools where our kids, we got them later, we closed the gap in math and about half closed it in ELA. And so this was the first time that he had seen effect sizes that large. Uh, but we've got about 500 of our children in college and we've got our kids uh, going into kindergarten. 100% uh, of our kids are in the kindergarten on grade level. So we're seeing uh, a lot of, I think, hopeful signals that this is really working. Uh, and I don't think it's an experiment anymore. I think now we have a way of actually turning around 
uh, poor children in uh, urban communities. Do you have to start at the cradle? We think our best practice is to start at the cradle because uh, what we want to have is our children compete with middle and upper middle class children. So while we get kids in college, we can't get them into the best colleges unless we start at the cradle. When you give me kids at the cradle, they'll be competing with children across America to get into some of the best colleges in this country. Uh, kids that we get when they're 13 or 14, we, you know, we get them through high school, we get them in colleges, but they, they can't compete for the best colleges uh, with other children because they've just had too many years of poor academic performance to try and make up. So we think our best practice is to get them early, get them on grade level. Those kids are going to be very competitive. You say that you will do whatever it takes. What's an extreme example of that? Well, look, we, we've had uh, young people that we were trying to get to lose weight because we've got this huge obesity issue, not just in America, but it's really bad in Harlem. And I had spent years trying to figure out how to solve the obesity problem with no success. Finally, I went to my kids and I said, look, you guys, if you all lose the weight, we're going to have teams. The team that loses the most weight, we're going to send them and their parents to Disney World because we needed the parents and the kids. Guess what happened? My kids lost weight. Uh, so now we you know there is an answer. The question is, can we do it year after year? So we try and think really outside the box and do very unorthodox things, sometimes going to the kids themselves and saying, you solved the problem, and if you do, we're going to do something wonderful for you. Uh, so our kids find that a lot of fun, and so do we. Can this be replicated in cities like Milwaukee that has a very big problem with an achievement gap and, and poverty uh, within the confines of a very strong teachers union? Yeah, here's one of the issues. I think the unions, the teachers unions, are going to have to confront the fact that if they don't change, they're going to go the way of the UAW, the United Auto Workers. Uh, you can't keep producing an inferior product, which the auto workers did, and think Americans aren't going to opt out. Uh, see, I'm old enough to remember when the first Japanese cars, everybody laughed at those funny-looking cars, saying, yeah, Americans will never buy those. But American cars were breaking down. So in the end, if, to avoid that kind of crisis, I think our teachers' unions are going to have to face the facts. We have to have change. And yes, I think you can get change even in Milwaukee, where the unions are very strong, uh, because there is not an alternative plan to get this done. Well, you've got to use data. You've got to use evaluation. You can't allow lousy teachers to stay in the system with no consequences, where children fail and all the adults get to keep their jobs and, and continue as if everything's fine. That system doesn't work in Milwaukee. It doesn't work in any poor inner city in this country. And we've got to change that. And I think a lot of us are very out in front saying uh, you've got to be part of the solution. You can no longer be part of the problem. What happens if we don't change these things? Uh, I think this very country is imperiled. Uh, you know, there's a new study that was produced by generals, the military generals, that said 75 percent of American young people between 17 and 24 cannot uh, qualify for the military. 75 percent. I'm not talking black kids or Latino kids. I couldn't believe the numbers. I had my staff research them. But when you look at, you have to have a high school diploma, you have to be physically fit, and you can have been arrested for a felony. That eliminated 75 percent of all the children in America of military age. We've got a crisis in this country, and we've got to come to grips with that crisis, and we've got to make sure that we're doing really aggressive things to solve this problem in this country.